Aloha everyone, this is Stephen Schutte at the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii. Today we're beginning our second session of our webinar, Envisioning Project-Based Language Learning. And uh, you're welcome to post questions or issues in the chat. Please address them to all panelists and attendees. You can keep a, an eye on the chat as we go forward. Uh, and uh, our first presenter is Barbara Bird. Uh, she's going to be presenting on gaming the curriculum. Uh, create, uh, this is a set of uh, games in her Italian class that her learners designed and created. Uh, if, if Barbara is ready, then we can go ahead. Great, well, thank you to the NFLRC and to all of the, you in attendance today. Just so you know, I will not be monitoring the chat during the presentation, but you're welcome to post comments and questions in the chat uh, as I'm talking, and we'll save those for the discussion after the presentation. Um, this is a prime example of the fact that not everything that happens in Vegas stays in Las Vegas. So um, this presentation is about um, an exploratory PBLL project that I created. And I called it Gaming the Curriculum, Creating Board Games for Local Italian Speakers. Um, if you're new to PBLL, we're in the same boat. Um, I know I've been uh, experimenting with it for a couple of years, but my experience started in 2015 when I enrolled in the online fundamentals of PBLL course. And uh, this was the maiden voyage of that uh, course, and it was a, a very exploratory and interesting experience for me. Uh, because prior to that, I really only knew uh, how to do a project in class, but I had not fully developed the idea of uh, how to use projects in a way that um, can really improve student learning. So um, I then participated in the PBLL Intensive Summer Institute in 2015, and I still consider my experience level to be novice. I've been experimenting with a variety of uh, projects um, and project-based learning uh, ideas, but I am still in the beginning stages of learning how to integrate it into my curriculum. Uh, I consider myself to be in the mess of the sandbox. So I start with these grandiose ideas of building uh, nice sand castles with all the materials that I have. And as I start to build them, uh, the higher and higher the buildings start to collapse. And uh, I try packing it in with more water and a little more effort. And at, at a certain point, the, the castles feel like they're starting to collapse. And that's the point where I end up adjusting some of my expectations and goals uh, for what the, what the project-based learning plan will be. And I am learning to accept and be okay with the mess um, and with the nicely shaped mound of sand that may not look exactly like I had intended, but which is still valid and useful. <clears throat> So um, the project that I'm going to talk about today is one of several exploratory projects that I've done. Um, and it, in this project, my students created a board game, which we then gave to uh, ch a class of children at a local nonprofit organization. So the context for it was a, it's a five week project that we did in my third semester Italian class. Um, there were student, seven students enrolled in that class, and you should know that that class only met once per week for three hours. And that's typical of upper level uh, courses here at a large community college in a city like Vegas, where um, people are, are working different shifts 24 seven, and have, are often full-time uh, workers in, a, in addition to uh, students. So it's actually not the norm that we have full-time students here at the college. Um, it's a large community college, about 40,000 students spread over three main campuses around the city. And uh, you can imagine that it, uh, it can feel a little chaotic at times. Um, these seven students uh, comprised ages from about 18 years old to maybe 60-ish years old. Um, there was a lawyer enrolled in the class, a female pilot, 
um, a graphic designer, and maybe three, what, three of what we would consider typical college students. So some of the main challenges that I faced in planning were uh, the audience. And I remember when I was at the Summer Institute, that was my big challenge because it was hard to find an authentic Italian audience they could appreciate the kind of work and, uh, and product that we might be able to produce as a fledgling uh, group of Italian speakers. So um, I also face a lot of pro uh, challenges with time constraints, as I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, I teach currently in, uh, in a rough academic situation, uh, six courses per semester on uh, two to three campuses per semester all over the city and I'm teaching both uh, online and in-person classes and uh, at a variety of times from morning to evening. So you can imagine that uh, with that kind of a schedule, it can be difficult to find the time to put in for planning purposes. Um, and the last challenge that I face is cultural authenticity. I worry that my students will have a difficult time going beyond the stereotypical ideas that they have about Italian and about Italy to uh, see the more nuanced and varied ideas that are um, truly what represent um, Italian and Italy. So the driving question I started with is how can a board game teach heritage learners about Italy and Italian culture? Um, here are the main elements of the project that I created. And for the entry event, it's maybe not as surprising or, or exciting as some of the other entry events that I've seen, but we played a variety of games um, in small groups in class. Um, and they were games that are in Italian. I have a bit of a collection of Italian games. And so the students had fun playing these different games and choosing which one was their favorite and which ones they felt they were most able to play. Um, so then I emphasize student voice and choice by allowing them to decide uh, what kind of game might be appropriate, what kind of uh, audience they wanted to aim it at. Um, key st skill and knowledge development was enacted through planning meetings outside of class. I asked students to record video conferences amongst themselves where they were asked to communicate only in Italian. Uh, we also had some planning meetings in class where um, they worked to define each student's roles or review who was doing what and how much time it would take them outside of class. Mind you, this is during a one-month class that meets one time per week. Or sorry, it's a four-month class and the project lasted about a month. Um, authenticity was important. And so we went through several, several revisions of the game board, of the instructions, of the question cards about regional culture. And really, the, the grammar and the language was uh, secondary to the thoughts and the ideas that were put into the, the final product. Um, we emphasized several steps of critique and revision, where I allowed the class to give a lot of feedback to each other on their various parts of the project. And then I also asked them probing questions about, um, about different elements of the class. Further, uh, sustained inquiry is supported by the several draft stages that we had. I think we started with one set of game cards and we went through three or four iterations before we finally arrived to a set of game cards that I felt was appropriate. Um, the public product was the, was the presentation of this board game to Casa Italiana, which I will talk about in a little bit. And then on the, fin on the final exam, I included some reflection questions um, about the experience so that I could understand better what worked for the students and what we could improve on in the future. So as the entry event, we played several different kinds of games. We played some games that were more card-based, we played several games that were also uh, board games or puzzle games. And in the end, the students chose to model their game after this uh, game, which is popular in Italy among children. It's called Il Grande Gioco dell'Italia. So they liked that. I think that it um, seemed uh, a little more straightforward to them and the language 
um, difficulty seemed a little less daunting. However, the actual creation of the product, I, th uh, I think, was a little more difficult based on the game that they chose. Casa Italiana di Las Vegas is the intended audience. And this is a nonprofit organization that was founded by a group of local Italians and Italophiles like myself about a year and a half ago. Um, and they, they put on different kinds of events around the city. They also offer courses for Italian, uh, for children and also for adults. And it was founded with the idea of supported, supporting learning of Italian for heritage students. So uh, we're very proud to have this organization in town and it also uh, provided me with, a, with a, an excellent audience for the product. Uh, one of the, the struggles that we faced initially was to find appropriate language for game instructions. Um, and to do this, I brought in a stack of instructions from all of the games that I have. And here you can see an image of some of the um, instructions for this uh, board game. And I asked the students to pull out vocabulary that they might need to use from uh, these instructions. So this was uh, generally a, a vocabulary building exercise. And one of my students who is a graphic designer created a website that included the vocabulary and information about the game. Um, so she did that just going the extra mile and doing something that maybe she felt a little more comfortable with. Um, and then uh, use of the target language was important throughout all stages of the process and especially during the process of creation, not just in the final product. So they did a lot of reading of these game instructions, which was complicated language, uh, instructional language, um, and a very different genre of, of uh, target language than they had been used to previously. Uh, we did our planning stages in target language, and that led to quite a bit of student frustration. Um, the lawyer who uh, is, was middle-aged, um, she uh, flat out refused it at one point to speak in Italian, and she said, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this anymore. I've got to get my piece out. And um, so there were a couple moments of student frustration and we calmed the nerves and carried on. And uh, in the end, students were very pleased with what they learned. And even the following semester, uh, even the lawyer explained that how frustrating it was. However, it was probably the most helpful thing to her language development. Um, I found out later that the students were recommunicating everything via text in English. So that is one challenge or support, just, just leaving that one out there. Um, I asked the students to create a weekly inventory of the time they spent on the project and explaining what they did on the project. I asked them to write it out. Um, I gave some instructions, but I realized after the fact that they needed a lot more scaffolding and, and more clear expectations in terms of what I expected in their weekly inventory. So here's just an image I took from their group planning sessions. This, I, I didn't want to try a video because I was worried about the audio coming through clearly. Um, so this is just a screenshot of one of their planning sessions. And they were conducted entirely in Italian. They lasted anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes each. Um, and it was wonderful to see the students actually communicating about something real during the planning sessions. Um, and that was conducted through our course management system, Canvas. Um, here are a couple samples, and they obviously are very different. Um, I didn't edit them for grammar, and I didn't uh, give the students feedback on grammar on these. Um, but they uh, created a real variety of, uh, of weekly inventories. So. I know when students are busy and have a lot of things going on, they, the student B may have understood what she was supposed to do. However, she may have been constrained for time um, and just gave me a simple assignment. So um, I received different kinds of inventory samples from uh, different students. And uh, that's one of the things that I would like to improve in the future 
the, the scaffolding for those weekly inventories um, to allow students a, a slightly easier way of understanding what my expectations would be. Uh, as I mentioned, we uh, tried to make this an authentic product that would be valid and, and valued by, uh, tar by the target audience and by native speakers. And so we struggled a lot with question development. Um, the students started out with some of these um, simple questions. I gave you some of the initial questions that are problematic. Um, they, first of all, the, the first question is a true or false question. And they said the national Italian dish is pizza. And false is the answer. The national Italian dish is pasta. That is some, that if that is true, and I have not looked up to see whether that is true, it's not something I've ever been aware of. And I have a lot more experience with Italian than my students do. So I think that they were going for easy question development rather than uh, a surface level qu question development, rather than really uh, getting into the things that would be important for their audience to learn. Um, another question that they created uh, is the second one. Milan was one of the most powerful and prosperous cities in Europe. Um, and they said, false, that is Florence. And uh, I think that uh, somebody who is from Milan, I suggested to them, might not take that question in the right way because Milan has been a powerful and prosperous city in different times of Europe. And so we had a lot of discussion around the, their first drafts of these questions. And, and I realized that it would have been helpful to give them um, a little more guidance at the beginning stages of their question development. Um, part of the game was to create um, the game board, which was essentially a map of Italy. And uh, the, in the first two drafts, the map of Italy was quite um, not to scale, didn't include a lot of places. And, you know, as you can imagine, if uh, we were to place Las Vegas in the state of California or on the coast, that might uh, uh, give us an idea that, that whoever created the game doesn't really know much about the geography of the place. And so we worked through several versions of that game board to create a more authentic map of Italy. And I apologize that I don't have pictures of all of these iterations. Uh, at the time that I was doing the project, it was definitely experimental and explorative, and I didn't take a lot of pictures. Um, this is a collaboration rubric that I found at the Buck Institute of, for Education on their website. Um, this is just the first page, but I asked the students at the end of the project to uh, self-evaluate using this collaboration rubric and then answer some questions. So this was actually helpful for them to understand um, what they had contributed and what they could have um, improved on. And I think that this would have been something helpful to give them at the beginning of the, of the group collaboration. Uh, the student feedback overall was very positive. They enjoyed creating the game. They had a sense of satisfaction and pride. And um, in the final event where we presented the product to the, uh, to the Italian children, we invited um, uh, several of the Italian children in, enrolled in classes to come to our class. Uh, along with their parents and some of the board members of Casa Italiana for an unveiling of the of the game and for um, and to, to allow the children to play the game with their parents um, help and so they I saw my students that day watching as these Italian children and adults um, explained to each other how to play the game asked and answered questions and I could see that they were really excited to have created something that was actually being put into use. There was a good sense of satisfaction. Um, they were also very frustrated about the using the target language during their planning sessions because it made it more difficult for them to get their point across. And I think that that frustration is a necessary step in language learning. And uh, it was emotionally a little challenging for some of them. But in the end, they found that that was 
one of the elements that taught them the most. Um, I also received a couple comments that they would like more guidance in the revision stages, and I completely agree with that. Um, it, it is complicated and messy to, to um, experiment with these projects, and it takes a lot of planning, and I uh, learned a lot that I can put into effect the next time that I try this project, and I do intend to redo this project. Um, some feedback that I have for myself in this messy sandbox is that uh, those planning sessions were one of the best ideas that I had, um, especially the out of class ones where I was not involved and so I was not a leader and the students um, collaborated and communicated among themselves. And I thought that was a very, those planning sessions were very effective. Um, I realized that the students need a lot more scaffolding at each step and that's a, a part of my planning that uh, was difficult due to time constraints, but it's also difficult just in project-based language learning to, uh, to anticipate uh, where students might have problems. Um, uh, the division of roles um, was slightly complicated. Um, the students each took different roles in creating the board game and some students uh, focused uh, very heavily on the artsy craftsy aspects of the game and didn't uh, involve themselves quite as much with the linguistic nature of the project. I think that's okay because uh, even the students who were working on the board game and the map of Italy and the, uh, the game spinners and, th and game cards and things, um, even they went through several iterations of the project and learned more about Italian geography and locations. And so it was definitely a learning experience for all, but I'd like to see a better division of the roles. Um, I would like to request next time some external feedback before the final version of the game. So share the game, share the uh, penultimate draft of the game with an audience who would be able to uh, provide some feedback and some suggestions before we create the final version. Um, and Casa Italiana, we, we gave the game to Casa Italiana. They keep it at their, um, at their, in their classroom. And I would like to maybe even add some additional game cards or, or uh, questions to them. Um, and I would like to, oh, that says longer time frame. I would prefer to um, do this over a longer period of time to give students a little more time to process and, and dig deep, deeper into the culture. So I'd prefer to do this over the space of two months rather than one month. But as I said, it was an issue of planning and time to be able to um, have the, the project planned out further in advance. The feedback from the Casa Italiana members was very positive. The children enjoyed playing the game. The parents were encouraging and excited to see something created for, the, for their children. And the board members were really pleased with the involvement and collaboration between CSN and uh, Casa Italiana. And they graciously gave each student in the class a one-year family membership to um, Casa Italiana, so they didn't have to pay for some of the events and courses or have a reduced rate for the courses. And some of the students from that class have continued to attend Casa Italiana events. Uh, one student brought her family to uh, a picnic that they hosted just a month after this board game was done. And to summarize my experience with PBLL this, thus far, um, I found it most helpful to start with whatever is the most difficult aspect for myself. So thus far it's been audience, but I'm starting to realize that uh, the audience can be a little bit less defined than I had um, imagined initially. So Casa Italiana provided a great audience for me but uh, my students can also post things publicly online or in public spaces on the college campuses or in uh, the library. And so there are a lot of different um, ways of, of refocusing that idea of audience. 
Um, it's important to experiment. I consider this experience a success, even though there are, uh, were some problems, and those are problems that I learned for, learn from for uh, future iterations of the project. Um, one size does not fit all. The same project, even with my uh, improvements and experience, may not work perfectly with a future class. And so it's important to uh, keep in mind uh, the, kind, the kind of audience that, that you have um, in terms of the students who will be participating in the class. Um, I am a type A personality and I like to have everything organized and set forth from the get-go. Um, and you can imagine how frustrating it can be to find yourself in the midst of this chaos and when it seems like your plans are slipping away. So uh, mentally and psychologically, I'm learning to embrace the chaos and go with the flow and your plans and your expectations will change as you move through the project, but um, not to let that overwhelm you as, uh, as the instructor. Uh, last, it's important to stick to your comfort level. I am a go-getter and I would love to implement full semester PBLL projects in all of my classes but that's not where my experience level is quite yet. And so I have scaled it back and decided to begin some small projects in as many classes as I feel comfortable. And it depends on the level. I am still struggling with uh, beginning level PBLL, like a lot of you, um, though I have a couple projects in the works that I would like to implement in a beginning level Italian class. So, grazie mille, um, and I think there's some time now for questions. Thank you very much, Barbara. This is Stephen at the University of Hawaii. I'm going to jump right in. You talked about uh, if you had the chance to do it all over again, your scaffolding would be more substantive to the students. But um, in this iteration that you completed, what kind of scaffolding were you able to provide? Uh, one of our attendees, Tatiana, was asking, uh, were the students provided useful target language phrasing during game creation? How did they manage when they were in their own meetings uh, doing their planning? Because you required them to speak only Italian. Did you sort of just throw them in the water without a life jacket? Or how, how <laughs> was that? Um, well, for their planning sessions, I gave them an outline of uh, what they, I expected them to discuss. Um, and they followed that outline pretty clearly. I didn't give them language for the planning sessions, um, like specific um, language for those planning sessions. Perhaps that would have been helpful to um, allow to allow them to express their opinions and ideas more more clearly, especially for the lawyer who's uh, who unfortunately isn't able to dedicate a lot of time outside of class to learning. She really struggled, I think, mainly because of her language level. Um, the the phases where we were developing questions and developing the instructions for the um, for the project. I did provide them with some sample language. We explored the kinds of language that were used in the game instructions, for example, and then pulled out some key elements, some key vocabulary, and then some key phrases. Um, for example, for the instructions, the kind of um, both descriptive and imperative uh, language that they would need to to write their own instructions, which were obviously a lot more simple than the instructions they had been reading. I'd like to point out that in that case, when you're having them look at the commercial uh, games produced in Italy and use those as a basis for developing their own instructions, you're bringing in uh, evidence from what we might call the real world or the professional world as a resource for your students' language learning, much as we saw uh, the young learners in Bob Lenz's example, where they were bringing in architectural expertise when they were doing their house plans. That's sort of along the same 
you know, continuum. Uh, and that idea of authenticity is really key, I think, in PBLL. There's a, another question about assessment. So we saw mm -hmm. that you assessed the collaborative process. Um, so aside, quite aside from assessing any language gains among the students, you asked mm -hmm. them to self-assess how well they collaborated, how effective they were as a team member and so forth. Can you uh, tell us anything else about assessment in your project in general? Was there a difference mm -hmm. between formative and summative and what were some of the assessment activities you did? Uh, I focused more on formative assessment during the process. Um, the students were required to turn in weekly uh, logs and those received a grade using a rubric. Um, it was a simple grade, uh, really uh, just, just to help them know if they were on, on track. And uh, the final product, I, since the contributions were so varied, I honestly didn't know how to assess it very well. And so as, in terms of assessment um, for the final product, I focused on the self-assessment collaboration. Uh -huh. um, uh, there was another question. How exactly does this project fit into the larger curriculum? Did you find that a point of difficulty to find a place for this? project within, say, the, the sort of textbook-based framework of a larger curriculum, or how is your larger curriculum structured? Um, it was in some ways a challenge because it was uh, clear when, you know, it, when it was project time and when it was other time. However, we tr I tried to coordinate what we were, the, the topics grammatically that we were studying along with the elements of the game development. And that um, is part of the reason why I chose this particular class for game development, because they had already um, covered certain grammatical forms and structures. Um, and so we emphasized those, but also integrated some of the new things that they were learning, such as um, more complicated kinds of grammar, uh, including future tense and pronouns and sentence structure. Uh -huh. um, I, I have a question of my own. Um, in beginning projects, uh, since the learners are at the novice or maybe the emerging intermediate level, we're used to thinking of students at those levels talking about themselves, talking about their families, talking about mm -hmm. really concrete sort of survival, yes. daily life oriented stuff. But on the other hand, in project-based learning, there is a mandate, an idea, that students should be engaging in deeper inquiry. In other words, they're trying to find, they're trying to ask questions, and then each question might lead to a different question. Sort of mm -hmm. like when a two or three year old child says, but why, right, you keep on asking. Mm -hmm. The reasons behind things and uh, I think that it, as far as PBLL goes the way that we respond to that is we try to find we try to uh, stay on the novice and intermediate level linguistically but we try to establish a reason why we are inquiring into those things so I'm wondering if you have had any ideas now that you've been through the project mm -hmm. this time whether there's any possibility for establishing a sort of a deeper layer to it. One possibility might be that you request that your students develop a game that shows the players something about themselves or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of psychological mm -hmm. uh, in some way. Um, I know that there are party games that are based on uh, people like, you know, having to do embarrassing things. Mm -hmm or maybe revealed secrets about themselves, things like that. Um, is it possible that we could, going forward, we could reframe the project uh, to, to make it a sort of a sort of deeper in that way? What would that look like? Yeah, I think that that would be a great way to, to do it. I left the decision of the type of game that they wanted to play up to the students, and they chose what I think for them felt like an easy way out, which is looking up facts and having true and false answer 
true and false questions. And eventually the later iterations of the questions were more, um, more uh, they, they were a little less true and false and a little less standard and a little more in depth, but they really weren't connected to themselves. And that was one of the struggles that we had during the game development. Because, uh, you know, if, they're used, if the students are used to doing the kinds of exercises that you do in textbooks and online workbooks and such, um, those kinds of questions aren't usually very introspective and personalized. Um, I think it could be really interesting if, if students chose to model a different game and uh, perhaps the instructor could make that more, of, could prioritize those types of games. I really left the choice up to the students and what kinds of questions they wanted to ask. They did, I think, learn something about um, uh, a deeper understanding of the language, of the culture, and especially of the perceptions of the audience uh, and how those things would, make, would take you beyond a surface level true and false question because the, those questions that may seem true or false and fact-based aren't necessarily always the case. Right, so you mentioned if someone from Milan heard that question mm -hmm. and the answer was Firenze, they might not be too happy. Right, because there's no time period given, there's, there are a lot of factors involved in that and uh, how do you rank what cities are important and what cities are not. Yeah. So we had a, a, a nice discussion around that, which I think deepened their perceptions of, of the facts, Factopedia that they're finding out, out on the internet. Good. I'd like to return to the planning meetings that the students conducted for which you provided a kind of procedural guidance, but mm -hmm. maybe not too much language guidance. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like when you go back to that in the future, you're mm -hmm. planning to provide more more of that scaffolding. Now, not all of our participants know what the term scaffolding means in full. So um, let's explore uh, how right now you have uh, mm -hmm. a worksheet or a document of some kind that says uh, you're going to work through these stages of your discussion. Now, uh, in order to help them stay in the target language for that, they need to have language to use. Um, but it might not be possible for them to get that language all memorized or practiced mm -hmm. in advance. So they might have to lean on some kind of a crutch, kind of like a tourist does when they use a phrase book to get around town. Mm -hmm. so, um, what are some of the kinds of scaffolding that is support for their language use could you provide on that worksheet if you had it to do over again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the worksheet asked for them to come up with um, with certain information, to decide on information, decide on a plan, and then there were spaces for them to include those various elements of the plan. However, I, in the future iteration, would like to include some linguistic scaffolding, which is just some linguistic aids to help them discuss. So even the student who may not have um, the, the best communicative ability can at least get a little participate a little bit more in the discussion so some of that would be just like the the um, sample project that Stephen actually had us do during the uh, summer Institute where he we we did a full project in Chinese and none of us knew Chinese and uh, he provided us with several sentence fragment fragments beginnings of sentences and we really just had to look up and provide a word to add to that sentence in order to communicate the meaning. And so I could um, provide some starters for sentences, for example. I think that the, a lot of the language they really had, it was more of a question of um, organizing their thoughts. Um, so I think some starter phrases uh, on the same worksheet that I, that I gave them for the final product would have been really helpful. Um, things question beginners like, I think that, or um, I would like to, uh, those kinds of linguistic scaffolding could be helpful for them. So those sentence frames could be combined with a word bank. You could mm -hmm. have uh, words that they can plug in to those sentence frames to sort of like a recipe for making the sentence that they want to make. Great. Yes, absolutely. 
there was another question about student sort of meta awareness of PBLL. If they're participating in a PBLL project, really understand what PBLL is, does that work? How much did you tell them about project-based learning? I didn't tell them a whole lot. Um, I, I presented the idea as a project. I didn't explain the various steps of PBLL and I hadn't actually considered doing that. I, I wonder if that would be helpful for them to understand. Um, I, did, I did actually talk about using the language in the process since a lot of problems came up during the process. When students are, are used to me directing the class and, and using primarily Italian in class, but when they break into small groups, they are used to, as in most classes, um, going uh, speaking in English um, more often than speaking in Italian. And so it was difficult for them to interact amongst themselves without as much guidance from me in the target language. So I did, I did give them a little bit more scaffolding on that aspect of the, of the project, but I didn't go through most of it with them. Great, thanks very much. Can you just remind us, what is the approximate actful level of these students? Are they say novice high? Uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely a variety in the class. The, I would say most of them would be novice high, yeah. Um, would you say that it's the case that a project is a good way of accommodating different proficiency levels among students? After all, there's so much about it which is flexible and customizable. You're not all in, in lockstep as far as language structures go, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the project-based learning, project -based learning um, is especially supportive of different language levels because you can uh, choose different roles in the project and not every student has to do the same thing. So um, I think that assigning or, I, I don't know about assigning roles, but having students self-select the roles that they feel most uh, comfortable with will uh, naturally help those students who, who may not have the proficiency level to do the more complicated linguistic tasks um, might push them a little bit towards the tasks that feel doable to them. And that is overall what happened during the project. Uh, I have one more question about the, the final product, the public mm -hmm. product. In some instances, uh, PBL-based classrooms really go for the professional level as far as creating a public product. Uh, after all, we saw those younger learners inviting a professional architect into their classroom. They were looking at mm -hmm. real blueprints. And uh, we can imagine that, uh, say, a high school, uh, PBL-based high school, they would be trying to basically create a public product that is at the standard of uh, a commercial or a professional product. Um, but to do that, you have to have material resources. And if you're sort of dabbling in PBLL, I wouldn't think that you would have a lot of money to produce a very finished, you know, commercial looking game board product. What did mm -hmm. the public product look like? And was there just one copy of it? Uh, yes, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, there was just one final product. Um, the students divvied up the expenses amongst themselves um, and they bought actual boxes to fit the game board. They bought the kind of card stock that you would use for a game board that's a little more sturdy and could be folded. Um, and they really went, I was surprised at how professional the final product looked. Um, I don't know exactly what the expense of the materials was, um, but a lot of the materials were actually created digitally and then just printed onto those materials. So I could see uh, doing, creating a game um, that is based not on a game board, but, but on cards or even on the internet, if, uh, you know, like an internet-based game as long as uh, computer usage and, and lab usage is, if that's not as much of an issue, 
then that could be a, a cost effective way of, of producing a gain. Uh, yeah, from what I understand, there are platforms uh, for developing uh, apps, you know, game mm -hmm. app for handheld devices where you sort of plug in your design and then your your game is uh, within the, the framework of that, whatever that uh, mm -hmm. app platform is. So that would be something to explore. That's great. Thank yeah, for, for our audience, I wanted to create a hard copy since uh, the Italian school does not have internet access. And so they needed to have a hard copy of the game. So that for us wasn't an option. Not to mention that making a, a hard copy game is sort of more easily achievable. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, once you're exploring the idea of a game for handheld, that, that would pose technical challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like the way that you reconciled your time available, your resources, av resources available, and uh, how you fit it all into your curriculum. And you really achieved uh, something that was very satisfying for your learners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, I mean, they were, they were talking about it uh, the next semester, six months later, they were still impressed by that experience more than the other experiences that they had had in that class and in their previous courses. So uh, as messy as it is and as imperfect as the project was, I still consider it a success because it, uh, it improved the learning of my students and that was the overall goal. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much for your presentation. And we hope to be seeing more projects from you in the future. Thank Barbara you. Bird from the College of Southern Nevada.